Good evening. And thank you for joining me. I know I can't see you in person and look forward to hopefully a future time when I can give these talks in person. But for now, we're going to do this virtually and there'll be time for questions at the end. So I'm going to break the talk down to three different topics. Number one, new thinking about breast cancer susceptibility. Number two, new approaches to the treatment of early stage breast cancer. And number three, new drugs for advanced breast cancer. So let's start with the question of who gets breast cancer. Well, breast cancer is predominantly a disease of women. One out of 100 breast cancer cases will occur in a man. Breast cancer, like other cancers, is a disease of aging, so it is more common to have a diagnosis of breast cancer as one gets older. We'll talk a little bit more about family history, but this is obviously an important risk factor. Estrogen exposure is important, and this has to do with exposure through menstrual cycles and pregnancies and um, also with other exposures. Lifestyle factors do matter. Um, healthy lifestyles such as regular exercise can lower the risk of breast cancer. Smoking and alcohol can increase the risk of breast cancer. And there are certain benign breast diseases such as atypical hyperplasia that can increase the risk of breast cancer. So let's look at these issues a little bit more closely. So hereditary susceptibility, we always think about, oh, family history. And, and the first thing I often hear from women with a new diagnosis is, but it's not in my family. But in reality, hereditary susceptibility only accounts for about 10 to 15% of all new breast cancer diagnoses. Estrogen exposure, however, is important for everyone. Um, women that may have started their menstrual periods at an earlier age and have menopause at a later age will have multiple years of cycling and exposure to estrogen. If the pregnancies occur early, then, and if there are multiple pregnancies, then there is less exposure. But obviously that's not a great strategy for, um, from a public health perspective to um, be promoting early pregnancies to try to reduce breast cancer risk. Um, we know that use of hormone medication after menopause can be associated with a higher risk of breast cancer. In particular, the combination of estrogen and progesterone can increase breast cancer risk. But one of the things that we've been particularly interested in studying is exposure to environmental estrogens. Now, my colleague at the, at the Rays of Hope Center for Breast Cancer Research, investigator Dr. Joe Jerry, often poses the question, if one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer, how are seven out of the eight protected? We keep focusing on this one of eight and what's going on that makes them susceptible. But the change in the focus is, well, can we understand more? about why these other women are protected if they've had similar exposures. And so that's been one of the themes this year for our research. Many of you may have heard of the Rays of Hope Center for Breast Cancer Research and the Breast Cancer Research Registry. We have an excellent collaboration with scientists at the Pioneer Valley Life Science Institute and UMass Amherst. Um, we have um, actually, this has been an IRB approved project for a number of years. We now have 1,365 um, individuals that are participants in the breast research registry. And we have over 400 that we have actual tissue samples from. And all of this has been put in a tissue repository that is really a rich resource for scientists to be able to study some of these important questions and really to kind of help us to put together a portrait of breast cancer in Western Massachusetts. Now, um, I'm going to show you some slides and um, uh, we'll try to go through them together just to give you an appreciation of what it is that these scientists are doing. So um, we have individuals in the registry with cancer, but also individuals that have surgery for breast reduction. So when you think about it, uh, breast reduction is done and all of that breast tissue is essentially tossed. 
Um, but that breast tissue can be so helpful and so important for studying these questions that we um, are bringing up. And so we've enrolled a number of women that are undergoing reduction mammoplasty surgery and said to them, is it possible for us to use some of this tissue that otherwise would be thrown out? And so um, that tissue can be used and put into culture to be able to do some additional testing. And some of the testing that our investigators have been particularly interested in is looking at DNA damage. So when we think about DNA damage, that's what causes cancer. Cancer, a normal cell will divide and a normal cell has a number of protective mechanisms. But when there's an insult to the cell and some damage, we need the cell to be able to repair. And sometimes the cell has trouble repairing and that's what can then lead to cancer. Now, one of the things that they've been using these tissue explants for, and that's what it's called when we take the tissue and they are um, um, putting it in culture, it's an explant, um, and they are using this to look at the different sensitivity to estrogen exposure. And so this, again, I'm just going to kind of go through this from a, a simpler perspective. Um, if these are people that are average risk, and then we add um, exposure to estrogen, there's not that much of an increase here between the average risk um, people when they get exposed to the estrogen. But that same estrogen exposure in a higher risk individual, they're already starting out with more susceptibility to DNA damage. And then here with that um, additional exposure to estrogen, this really increases. And so what we're hoping is that this is going to be, um, this is going to be uh, increasing um, from the high risk to the low risk, and that this might help us to be able to differentiate those individuals. This is one of the recent publications led by Karen Dunphy, again with this theme of inter-individual variation response to estrogen and human breast explants. And I want to point this out because this is what the breast um, re repository and research registry have been so helpful in scientists being able to move forward. And as you can see, the acknowledgements, um, in addition to grants from the NIH, um, that this um, we acknowledge Raise of Hope Center for Breast Cancer Research. Um, Karen Dunphy has recently used this preliminary work to get an additional grant to really further these studies, um, which again, the theme of Raise of Hope being able to give startup funds so that we get preliminary data and then apply for larger grants. Um, another study um, that was done by Rays of Hope co-investigators looking at a hereditary susceptibility and why, at least in this mouse model, not all the mice with this hereditary susceptibility get cancer. So how do we understand about why, how there could be repair in, these, um, in this DNA damage in some but not others? Again, supported by Rays of Hope. One of the other questions that has been of great interest is the effects of environmental chemical exposure, in particular environmental estrogens. And again, um, using these, uh, these patient-derived breast tissue explants has helped this study along and again, funded by Rays of Hope. And then finally, um, this work was done and recently published as well. Um, and this is looking at benzophenone 3 and propylparaben on estrogen receptor dependent DNA damage, R loops and DNA damage in breast epithelial cells. So, again, looking at this damage in the DNA and the difficulty repairing it. Um, and this is work that's all possible because of Rays of Hope and the Breast Registry and the Tissue Repository. So, to kind of sum up this work, it's all preliminary. Um, but um, they looked at these um, propylparabens and BP3 found in cosmetics, personal care items, and sunscreens. So everybody's exposed to these. So is it possible that some people are more susceptible? And certainly because DNA damage can lead to cancer, individuals may have highly variable responses to these environmental estrogens, and that's called a genetic polymorphisms. So some individuals may be more sensitive than others. So we're really, this is just very preliminary work. Um, it's very exciting work.
And um, there have been additional grants to support taking this work to the next level. Um, but again, this is something preliminary through Rays of Hope. Well, how will this be helpful? Why is this important? Well, we really wanna be able to understand who's at higher risk and who's at lower risk. It's all about personalizing care. So if we can say uh, to an individual woman, and for example, testing them to these estrogen susceptibilities. So again, this is not something that's available now. This is something that is being done from an investigational perspective. But let's just say that we could identify these women that might be at higher risk. Well, those might be individuals that might have more frequent screening. They might have additional screening tests. So perhaps in addition to mammography, they might have breast MRI or ultrasound. They also might be candidates for risk-reducing medication. We have a number of medicines that women can take to lower their risk of breast cancer. This includes tamoxifen, raloxifene, aromatase inhibitors. So um, that would be a, a very important message to a woman that we've identified you as higher risk and these medications could lower your risk by a significant amount. And then of course, healthy lifestyles is, is for everyone. So what about if we're able to, again, do these tests and say to someone, you're at lower risk? Well, again, healthy lifestyles is for everyone, but perhaps those individuals don't need the annual screening. Perhaps every other year, mammography might be appropriate, or maybe at a certain age, it might be appropriate to make it less frequent. There would be no need for additional screening tests that might be costly and might lead to additional other tests. And there would be no need to consider risk-reducing medication. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears now from our research on breast cancer susceptibility to the clinic, to what we're doing every day when we see women with early-stage breast cancer. And the two approaches and the two themes that I want to bring up that have to do with new approaches to breast cancer treatment have to do with, first of all, the question of who really needs chemotherapy? And second of all, the question, when do we need to give chemotherapy before surgery? So I have to give you a little primer on breast cancer, and that'll help you to understand breast cancer treatment. After a woman has a biopsy, the biopsy goes to the pathologist, and the pathologist is doing some stains to look at it under the microscope. And these are the traditional stains that are done. Then they do an extra stain for something called estrogen receptor, another stain for progesterone receptor, and another stain for HER2. So these are all on the surface of the cells. And if we look at this particular panel here, this is estrogen and progesterone receptor positive. If we go down this way. So we can see that the cells here picked up this dark stain for estrogen receptor positive, and again, for progesterone receptor positive, but nothing picked up for HER2. So this breast cancer would be what we call hormone receptor positive, ERPR positive, and HER2 negative. So let's take the next one. So the next one here, the ER is positive. Again, you see this dark brown stain. The PR is positive, this dark brown stain. Now here, this is also positive for the HER2. So all three of these are positive. So this is very important in helping us to determine the type of treatment that this individual needs. Now let's go to the next one. So this next one here, the ER is negative, so you can see there's none of that brown staining. The PR is negative, there's none of that staining, but the HER2 is positive. So this particular patient would be ER negative, PR negative, but HER2 positive. And finally, this last category, we can see that this didn't pick up any of the stains for the ER, the PR, or the HER2. This is ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative, and sometimes this is called triple negative breast cancer. So you'll hear me use that term as we move ahead. So more definitions. Again, I have to give you a primer so you can understand what's new. You have to understand what's, what's uh, the standard approach. So what is adjuvant systemic treatment? So adjuvant means extra. So Women will have surgery and radiation to address the breast 
area. But there, even in people that have no cancer that spread to the lymph nodes, cancer cells could have escaped from the breast area to the rest of the body. And even though after surgery, we tell women you're cancer free, this extra treatment, this adjuvant treatment may be extremely important in lowering the risk of breast cancer coming back in the years to come. So adjuvant means extra. So um, systemic, the word systemic means that it goes throughout your system, throughout the bloodstream. So that makes it very different from surgery and radiation, which just treat specific sites. They just treat the breast and, and lymph node areas in that region. Now, endocrine therapy are anti-estrogen pills that are usually taken for five to 10 years. So those medicines are prescribed for individuals that have ER, PR positive breast cancers. In other words, hormone positive breast cancers. Examples of these drugs include tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, such as anastrozole, exemestane, and letrozole. Now, chemotherapy are drugs that are generally given intravenously. Chemotherapy are medications that attack rapidly dividing cells. So they are appropriate to use whether it's estrogen receptor positive or estrogen receptor negative, whether it's HER2 positive or HER2 negative. So chemotherapy basically attacks cancer cells because they are rapidly dividing cells. HER2 directed treatment are drugs that target the HER2 positive cells. So again, you saw that in the panel that we were testing. So this is a hugely important piece of understanding breast cancer treatment. And it's really in the last decade and the last um, 20 years that this is um, something that we've been really focusing a lot on. Um, the HER2 directed treatments are often monoclonal antibodies, but they can also be small targeted treatments. And they're generally given in combination with chemotherapy. So to understand breast cancer treatment, let's look at the whole big picture. And the big picture is that most breast cancer is hormone receptor positive, HER2 new negative. So that ERPR positive, HER2 negative is 71% of all new breast cancers. Now, the HER2 positive breast cancers, hormone receptor negative, HER2 positive, 5%, Hormone receptor positive, HER2 positive is 12%. So all in all, maybe about 17% to 17 to 20% of the breast cancers that we see have too much of this HER2 or what we call overexpress HER2, HER2 positive cancers. So that's about 20%. And then finally, that group that is ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative, also known as triple negative breast cancer, represent about 12% of breast cancers. So these are gonna be treated always with chemotherapy. These are gonna be treated with HER2 directed treatment and chemotherapy. And these will be treated in a very specific fashion that we're gonna talk about that will always include endocrine therapy, but may or may not include chemotherapy. So who is considered for chemotherapy? Well, a lot has changed in the last 20 years. In the year 2000, the NIH consensus statement came out um, recommending that any patients that had tumors over a centimeter, whether there was lymph node involvement or not, should receive chemotherapy. So that's huge. That was a large majority of all of the patients with a new diagnosis of breast cancer. So we've learned a lot and we've come a long way in the 20 years. So now, as I mentioned to you, the triple negative cancers, pretty much all of them, except for the very smallest ones, we would recommend chemotherapy. The HER2 positive cancers, except for the very smallest one, we would recommend chemotherapy with a HER2 directed treatment. But for those estrogen receptor positive, the hormone receptor positive patients, we're really going to look closely at their anatomy and at molecular features to decide who really needs chemotherapy. So it's no longer one size fits all. When we see a new patient that has endocrine um, uh, ER positive breast cancer, 
we're going to look very closely at the patient, their age, their overall health, and whether they're pre or postmenopausal when we're making the decision about chemotherapy. We're going to look at the tumor anatomy, the size of the tumor, how big is it, whether there's lymph node involvement, whether there are no lymph nodes involved, whether there are one to three, or whether there are four or more lymph nodes. And then when we look at the tumor under the microscope, the pathologist will give us a grade, one, two, or three. And so we want to look, is it a lower grade? Is it intermediate? Is it high grade? Now, we take all of this information, and then we may also do a molecular test on the tumor that looks at the genetics of the cancer to see about how aggressive potentially it could be. And this is called the recurrence score, or Oncotype DX. So these tumor molecular assays are important because the profile can be associated with more rapid growth and a poorer prognosis. This test can also be associated with chemotherapy benefit. So it can tell us who really needs chemotherapy the most and who really will be fine with just the hormone medication alone without the addition of chemotherapy. Now, when we do this test, there's um, basically we ask the pathologist to send um, one of the slides to this laboratory of the tumor so that the patient is not having anything extra done themselves. It's basically a slide from their surgery. And the uh, calculation of this molecular profile is based on a data set using genes that are associated with high risk of recurrence despite an individual taking the endocrine treatment. And it gives us a sense of if it's a high proliferation, meaning high growth rate versus low growth rate. And as I mentioned, it can be associated with prognosis, meaning a poor prognosis, but it's also predictive to help us predict who will really benefit from chemotherapy. So this is an example of what a report looks like. So when I get the report back, I'll get a score. So for this particular case, the score was 18. Um, and the scores go anywhere from zero to 100. Um, so a score of 18 is associated, if this patient takes their endocrine therapy, so the aromatase inhibitor or tamoxifen, and they take the medicine for five years, then at the end of nine years, they'll have a 5% risk of recurrence. Um, and this is uh, so good that the benefit for chemotherapy really is less than 1%. So what this tells me is that this patient has such a good prognosis with the endocrine therapy alone that chemotherapy really doesn't add much. And we really don't need to consider chemotherapy for this individual. Now, what this doesn't tell us is that this person doesn't need anything. No, this is saying that with endocrine therapy, the endocrine therapy is effective enough for this patient that they will be at low risk of recurrence. Now, it, we can further break this up um, in, in terms of patients' ages. Younger patients can have a worse prognosis, especially very young patients in their 30s. Um, and so we may not necessarily interpret things exactly the same for younger patients. And so you can see here that for patients that are over 50, even up to a score of 25, um, there's no chemotherapy benefit. But for individuals that are young, there may be starting to see a chemotherapy benefit at scores of 16 and above. But of course, the higher the score, the more the chemotherapy benefit. And then the other thing that we get, the other piece of information we get with the recurrence score is it also repeats the ER, PR, and the HER2 that we would have done in the initial, um, the initial evaluation of the pathology. So um, this was a large study, and actually Bay State um, participated in this study. It was called the Taylor X study. And this was um, for individuals that had no involvement of lymph nodes and that had estrogen receptor positive, HER2 new negative cancers. They were um, randomly assigned, they would get their, um, their recurrence score. And we knew that the recurrence scores that were less than 10 were associated with a very low risk of recurrence and they would get their hormone treatment alone. We knew that with the recurrence scores of 25 to 100, 
that they would um, be at high risk and chemotherapy would be important in addition to the endocrine therapy. But what happened in this study is those people that had these in-between scores, 11 to 25, um, they were randomly assigned to either get chemotherapy plus the endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. And the findings were quite interesting because um, in many of the older patients, there wasn't as much of a benefit to the chemotherapy, but in the younger patients, there still was in particular in some of these intermediate scores. Now, um, so we've been incorporating this um, recurrent score with patients that have no disease in the lymph node. So one of our ideas was, well, is it that different? Is the biology of the cancer that different just based on whether there's a lymph node involved or not? And can we use the same thinking in people that have lymph node involvement? So at the time of breast cancer surgery, the lymph nodes um, may be sampled, sometimes sentinel nodes, just um, a couple, um, sometimes more extensive axillary surgery. So this particular study called um, RS Ponder um, was just presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium this past December. And so this is very new information. It's not yet been published. It's only pertinent to women that are um, that have one to three lymph nodes involved with cancer. And these individuals were randomly assigned to chemotherapy plus hormone versus hormone alone, again, if they were in these um, intermediate risk groups. Um, so um, what did they find? So they found that all premenopausal women benefited from chemotherapy when they had lymph node involvement. But the postmenopausal women, really the chemotherapy was most important when they had a high risk score of over 25. Um, now, one of the questions that's raised is what sometimes happens with chemotherapy with very young women is it puts them into menopause. And when you put somebody into menopause, then there's not estrogen um, uh, that can influence the growth of the cancer. So there's still some interesting questions that um, are unanswered about perhaps is ovarian suppression. In other words, if we give medicines to turn off the ovaries along with our endocrine therapy, could that be as good as chemotherapy? So more to come on this. Um, but the bottom line on this molecular testing for early stage breast cancer is it can be used to select patients whose tumors are so sensitive to hormone treatment that chemotherapy adds little additional benefit. In the last decade, there's been a 30% reduction in the use of chemotherapy. So again, you know, we use chemotherapy much more frequently um, back um, uh, 10 and 20 years ago. Um, but now we're really, really being much more judicious and using it for those individuals that need it the most. And this has been associated with about $100 million per year savings um, because these people are not needing chemotherapy. Okay, so the second part of um, what's new in breast cancer treatment for early stage patients has to do with the order that we give treatments. So the usual order is that surgery comes first, chemotherapy if it's needed comes next, and then radiation follows. Now, sometimes it may be beneficial to give chemotherapy before surgery and then do the surgery and the radiation. So that's what we're gonna look into a little bit. So why would we wanna give chemotherapy first? So some patients when they see the surgeon are just not candidates for surgery. And the reason for that is they may have an inflammatory breast cancer. This is a breast cancer where there's involvement of the skin. It's a, it's a red, hot breast. It is something that sometimes the doctors that are not familiar with this think maybe there's an infection in the breast. And sometimes these patients get treated for an infection when in fact this redness in the breast is an inflammatory breast cancer. Um, locally advanced breast cancers are breast cancers that are fixed to the chest or the skin, that there's edema, that it's broken through and ulcerated, that there's um, very significant lymph node involvement and a large and extensive tumor. So in these cases, this, these patients cannot have surgery first. They have to have chemotherapy to try to shrink the cancer to go from inoperable to operable. Thankfully, 
These situations are uncommon. We do see them, but this is the um, less common scenario. What's more common is we see a number of people that are candidates for surgery, but perhaps they have a large tumor and if they did have surgery now, they'd need a mastectomy. Perhaps by giving chemotherapy up front, we can convert a mastectomy to breast conserving surgery. Perhaps we can allow for less invasive surgery under the arm, for example, um, in terms of the lymph node surgery. Sometimes individuals may need more time to have genetic testing and planning. And so this may, if we know that they need chemotherapy anyway, this gives them the chance to be able to have time to make decisions about the optimal surgery. Thankfully, this situation is rare, but if surgery needed to be delayed during pregnancy, there are certain chemotherapy drugs that can safely be given to control a cancer during pregnancy. We um, may want to be able to assess the efficacy of our treatment and tailor our post-operative treatment. So this is a very important 2020 goal for giving chemotherapy first. We now have a whole number of options of what we can do to personalize treatment based on how people respond to chemotherapy given up front. And then finally, this gives us a chance to be able to understand their prognosis. So if we give chemotherapy up front and then they the patient goes ahead for surgery and at the time of surgery, there's no cancer left. That's what we call a pathologic complete response. And those people can have an excellent prognosis. So this residual disease at the time of surgery really gives us a chance to personalize treatment. Um, I listed these, and, and again, um, I don't need you to, uh, I don't want to focus on exactly the drugs other than for you to understand that if um, we, if there was no disease at the time of surgery, we would just continue the same monoclonal antibodies. But if there was still disease at the time of surgery in the HER2 positive patients, we have data that tells us that the, um, we can switch monoclonal antibodies and people will do better um, with residual disease. Um, so um, the um, uh, triple negative patients, we have options for chemotherapy. Op we have um, immunotherapy that's being looked at at clinical trials. And we have a PARP inhibitor. So people that have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, um, there are specific medications that just in this last year have been FDA approved to be given to individuals with residual cancer. Um, and then finally, for the hormone receptor positive patients, well, they may have gotten pre-op chemo, but they still haven't gotten potentially their most effective treatment, the hormone treatment. There are ways that we can maximize this with other targeted agents and um, bone strengthening agents and PARP inhibitors if they're BRCA positive. And of course, this is a great opportunity for clinical trials. So without, again, really focusing too much on the specifics, the point here is that we can better predict a person's prognosis, and we can better personalize their care when we can see the results after the initial chemotherapy. So in summary, neoadjuvant therapy increases the rates of breast conserving treatment. So a number of women that might have needed a mastectomy could have a lesser surgery. There might be a slight difference in the recurrence in the breast, but there's no difference in survival. There's no difference in distant recurrence. Pathologic complete response, especially in the triple negative cancers and HER2 positive cancers, is a strong predictor of survival. So when we achieve this, um, we're very excited for these patients. Um, but for those people that have residual disease, we have now many more additional treatments that we can um, administer that we can help them to be able to achieve the best results. Um, so, you know, part of this is kind of a, a theme of escalating and de-escalating because we're also looking at giving people less treatment um, before we do the surgery. And potentially some of those people will get a complete pathologic response with even lesser, less toxic um, treatment. Okay, so now down to the last third of the talk, and this is about new drugs for advanced breast cancer. So um, we wanna test the tumor to find targets for treatment. 
And so again, I'm going to give you a little background on um, uh, some definitions that I think often people get confused about. I mean, we're talking about genetics and mutations and um, genetic testing, and there's a very important distinction that I want you to appreciate. So tumors have lots of mutations and they're acquired through cell division. They're passed on to other cells, but they're not transmitted to offspring. So in other words, if a person has a cancer that has all these mutations, that's not something they can, that they have the possibility of having passed on to their offspring. Tumors can have more than 10,000 mutations, but some of these mutations may serve as targets for treatment. So that's one of the things you're going to hear me talking about is targeted treatment. I want to be very clear that this tumor genetics is not the same as hereditary susceptibility. Um, so this is germline testing. So when we talk about, for example, BRCA1 and BRCA2, that's a mutation that an individual is born with that's transmitted to, that has a 50-50 chance of being transmitted to their offspring, and it's present in all of their cells. So we'll see it in the tumor, but it's present in all of their cells because this is something that they were born with. So again, these are hereditary germline mutations, very different from tumor genetics. Um, so um, the, there's just been an explosion of new drugs um, over the years. Um, between 1949 and 1988, there were only eight drugs for breast cancer. Um, during this almost 40 year period, there were 22 drugs. Um, but then, you know, the last decade um, in particular, um, there have been a number of new drugs, um, 2014 to 2018, four drugs. But in 2019, there were three drugs. And in 2020, there were four drugs. Cancer drugs represent the largest category of new drug approvals. And it, in uh, 2020, um, there were 21 new drugs. This is for all new cancers. So again, you know, compared to the difference in getting approvals for cancers, uh, for drugs that are non-cancer drugs, um, there is a lot going on. And despite the pandemic, there have been new drugs and new approvals and a lot happening in terms of new treatment. Um, so here I am, I'm going to talk to you with this word targets. So you know, the, we talked about how with ER and PR positive cancers, we have hormone treatment. With HER2 positive cancers, we have the HER2 directed treatment. But the triple negative cancers, ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative, um, what is their target? Uh, so we are studying cell um, dynamics and looking at the cells and trying to identify parts of the mechanisms that help the cell to divide that potentially could be targets for treatment. So one of them that, for example, is very helpful for those with um, uh, hereditary susceptibilities is this deficiency uh, and what's called a PARP inhibitor. These drugs can um, be important in terms of DNA repair. Um, there are um, uh, There is a mutation called AKT that we have some drugs that can target this. Um, there are um, immunotherapy drugs that can be targets um, for what's called um, PDL1 program cell death. Um, so we are looking at different targets for the um, triple negative cancers. Um, now, in terms of the um, endocrine therapies, um, so um, tamoxifen was one of the first cancer medications. To, to be, and actually one of the world's most widely pre pre um, prescribed cancer medications for a long time. Tamoxifen actually started out in the 70s. It was a failed birth control pill, and it almost got tossed when um, one of the investigators um, made some observations on the use of tamoxifen um, for um, breast cancer treatment. And um, tamoxifen um, works in estrogen and progesterone receptor positive cancers. Uh, which, as we talked about, is 70% of the cancers, um, it um, works in both premenopausal and postmenopausal women. And as you can see, for almost um, 20 years, that was the hormone treatment for breast cancer. The class of medicines called aromatase inhibitors, um, anastrozole, exemestane, letrozole, these medications came into play um, in the late 1990s. Um, initially in advanced disease, and now we're using them upfront in early stage disease. 
Other categories of endocrine treatment, um, something called a SERD, Selective Estrogen Receptor Disruptor. And these are um, medicines that we're using in more advanced breast cancer. But now we have other targets that we also can include um, with these endocrine treatments that help to really, these, these agents help to supercharge the hormone treatment. Some of these med medications, uh, ribociclib, abemaciclib, um, and palbociclib, um, these are called CDK4-6 inhibitors. Again, these mechanisms are not so important for our discussion today. What I want you to appreciate is that, look at this, this is between 2014 uh, to the present. These new agents help us to supercharge our hormone treatments. So um, in terms of the HER2 story, so um, HER2 testing started in the 90s and trastuzumab was first approved for the treatment of advanced metastatic cancer in 1998. Um, and this was really a game changer because these cancers can be very rapidly growing, very aggressive cancers, but this monoclonal antibody specifically targeted to this treatment was widely effective. Um, it took some time for it to be treated, as, so to, for it to be studied, and for it to be brought up into the use in early stage disease, um, and that happened in 2006. Um, again, the trastuzumab was the only HER2-directed treatment we had for a long time, um, and now in the last um, 10 to 12 plus years, we've had a number of medications that are HER2-directed that have been approved. Um, and all these approvals generally come for metastatic breast cancer first before we sometimes consider them for earlier breast cancer. Um, but just um, in the last few years, um, four more medications for HER2-directed treatment. So again, trastuzumab was the only one for a long time. Um, and then now we have a number of additional agents um, that are highly effective. So metastatic breast cancer is not curable, but it's treatable and the large repertoire of treatments has helped our patients to live longer. The hormone positive patients can be treated with endocrine therapy and these additional targeted agents that really supercharge the hormone treatments. The HER2 positive patients now have choices of a number of new drugs um, that are appropriate for advanced disease. For triple negative patients, this is the group we're still doing a lot of testing for targets. Um, we have new chemotherapy drugs. We have new targets that we're um, uh, addressing. Um, and this group um, has had benefit recently with new drugs, but we continue to look for more targets um, for this particular group. For anyone that has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, this class of drugs called PARP inhibitors helps um, to address the issue of DNA repair. And then we will test the tumor from biopsy or circulating tumor cells in the blood for other targets and also for the use of immunotherapy. Now, um, we've come a long way. If you look at 1973 data compared to 2019, so in 1973, if you had a localized breast cancer, so localized meaning um, uh, a stage one or, or two breast cancer, uh, that you would have an 85% likelihood of being alive and cancer-free at five years. So look at the um, total data for 2019, so 99%, so 85 to 99. For people that have regional disease, that's, for example, uh, more extensive lymph node involvement, 53% versus 86%. And then finally, we used to, as we said, metastatic disease is not curable, but it's treatable. But in the 70s and, and before that, it was rare to see anyone live longer than five years. Now we have 28% of people with metastatic disease can live beyond five years. And we're hoping with new drugs every year that these individuals will have more options and be able to live longer. Now, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that although we're very pleased with the improvement in survivals, that there are discrepancies and there are disparities um, in terms of the races. Um, so you can see here that for um, Black individuals, the numbers are not as good as white. 
and in all of these categories, in particular here with distant disease. So we have a lot of work to do addressing disparities. At Bay State, we do have a clinical trial uh, that's specifically for um, women who identify as Black, looking at the way that they respond to one of the commonly used chemotherapy agents to see is, if there are some um, issues, some genetic um, changes in the way that they might respond that might have to do with um, these disparities. So a lot more to come here. We still have a lot of work to do, but um, we really have come a long way. So breast cancer treatment 2021, we want to select patients who may benefit from chemotherapy before surgery. We want to really de-escalate care for low-risk patients. We're giving less chemotherapy. And for we want to personalize the care for high-risk patients. And those individuals will need chemotherapy and targeted agents. And we want to maximize our hormone strategies, perhaps with ovarian suppression in premenopausal women, bone strengthening agents, and these targeted agents. So the bottom line is we're looking to personalize treatment for all. So we've made incremental gains thanks to clinical trials and basic science research. I'm grateful to Rays of Hope for all of the support in what we do to take care of our patients, but also on the research side. And thank you for all of your attention. And with that, I'm happy to um, answer questions. Thank you, doctor. I have to applaud you and your team. That was an amazing presentation and really exciting things that you're doing in research. So I applaud you. Thank you. There are, there are um, a couple of questions in the Q&A box, and we do invite all attendees to type any questions and we'll get to them now. First of all, I'd like to start with Chris, who made a comment earlier on that said that this is so interesting and she's thanking you um, for your presentation. Uh, Sarah would like to know, when might be advisable for ultrasound in addition to mammogram for women with de dense breasts and lumpectomy? Would you think it makes sense to alternate each test every six months? I know one of our um, topics for this series will address breast imaging. So I really didn't um, get into what's new in breast imaging. Um, I think that um, there are still highly personalized recommendations based on an individual's risk. Ultrasound does have, um, it's very, um, uh, very much dependent on who's performing the test. Um, it sometimes um, can be harder to interpret. Um, and um, uh, not necessarily as sensitive or specific. Um, so um, although there are some suggestions for women with dense breasts to consider additional imaging, I think that we make recommendations on an individualized basis. Thank you. Um, Sarah also has another question, and I'm hoping that I pronounce this correctly, but what is your feeling about Zometa for women on anastrozole? Anastrozole. Okay, no, that's a great question. Thank you for that. So I, I you know, I, I didn't get into that in detail. I used the word bisphosphonate and the uh, zoledronic acid, um, or also known as Zometa, um, has been shown in postmenopausal women on aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole to reduce the risk of fractures, but also to lower the risk of recurrence by a significant percentage. Um, so in making the decision about who would benefit from a bisphosphonate in addition to the endocrine treatment, um, I look at the patient factors. So in other words, if somebody is already starting out with osteoporosis, then that's a very helpful treatment. Um, but then I also will look at the tumor factors. And if somebody is at high risk, of cancer coming back, even if they have a normal bone density, I will discuss the bisphosphonates with them. So the, the discussion has to do with the individual's bone density and their risk of fractures and their breast cancer and the risk of breast cancer recurrence. Thank you for that. Um, there's uh, one comment that this person said that they are very proud of Rays of Hope. 
And as a chair, I'm sure <laughs> you feel uh, the same way. Um, it's terrific that those funds are going to. Yeah, uh, and we, we're we're sorry that this year we're not in person. Um, and hopefully next year we will be. Um, I think this has been a tough year for everybody, but I think Rays of Hope has been particularly important this year in um, supporting us to continue on our mission, to continue to be able to help patients and and um, and to continue to uh, have the research move forward uh, again, despite um, the pandemic. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't see any other questions here in the chat box, so we'll just give it another minute. Um, and maybe this is a good time to just, while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions, to mention tomorrow evening's talk with Dr. Friedrich, who's going to be talking about Webb's most searched questions answered regarding breast cancer. So anything that has been most popular on the internet searches she's going to be talking about tomorrow evening at six o'clock. And, oh, Cindy wanted to make mention to you, doctor, that this was very helpful and that she says, thank you. Oh, and Pam has a question. How much exercise do you re recommend weekly in diet? Uh, so I'm a big proponent of healthy lifestyles. Um, exercise at all phases of life um, helps to lower risk of breast cancer. So it doesn't matter if you're starting later in life or if, you're, if you've are if you been exercising all along. Um, generally, um, about 120 minutes a week would be the minimum. Um, 150 minutes per week would be nice. Um, and um, again, uh, I think that um, it can be a combination of, of things. Um, in terms of diet, there's no breast cancer prevention diet per se. However, the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association really um, uh, recommend the same type of diet, which is basically the Mediterranean diet. I think people are probably all familiar with that. Um, but, um, uh, you know, healthy eating, um, uh, minimizing alcohol, not smoking, regular exercise, these are all things that um, individuals um, can do, um, and um, uh, I, I will continue to promote that. Excellent. Um, I have a comment for you, and then we have another question. Uh, Jamie would like you to know that this was an awesome presentation. Thanks for all the work you do and the care given to each patient's individual experience. Thank you that for that. Very nice. Uh, Carolyn would like to know, have there been study results for long-term use of aromatasis inhibitors of uh, 15 to 20 years, question mark? Um, so yeah, we, we, are, um, we have um, had a number of those studies in particular beyond 10 years. So, um, so let me kind of back up and, and give a little, um, a little bit more information. So the, the standard duration of aromatase inhibitors is for five years. There are some studies looking at, and there have been studies that have looked at five years versus 10 years. And for most people, five years is enough. Um, for people that are at particularly high risk, um, 10 years could be better. The concern with um, five years versus 10 years is that five extra years um, is a concern potentially for the bone density and fracture risk. So that in terms of the long-term, um, being on the aromatase inhibitor longer than five years in particular, um, we would be um, selecting patients that, you know, really um, we were less concerned about their bone density or that they were maintaining a good bone density despite being on the medication. Um, in terms of um, other long-term toxicities, I think, again, the, the bone density is the most important one. Um, and um, overall, these medicines are um, safe um, and effective. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Lisa would like to thank you and thank the Rays of Hope. Pam um, did say she agreed um, with your information and said it was fascinating and she appreciates all you do. Cindy has a question. Are there any alternative treatments, such as any vitamins or minerals, 
Um, again, um, I, I wish that there was um, something that I could say would be important in preventing breast cancer. Um, what I can say um, is that um, vitamin D is important in uh, maintaining bone health. So any woman beyond menopause um, should be um, taking vitamin D because you're not going to get vitamin D from the sunlight living in the Northeast. Um, and vitamin D is not going to be easily um, accessible from diet. Um, so, uh, you know, again, in terms of bone health, um, vitamin D is very important. Um, calcium is best from your diet. Um, so that doesn't need to be a supplement. But in terms of a supplement that could prevent breast cancer, um, I wish I had an answer for that. And, and who knows, maybe that'll be something um, in the future. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we just have a couple more comments and then we're at time. But Sarah wanted to thank you so much for your presentation. It was extremely informative and relevant. And Carolyn said, thank you so much for this program. So uh, with that, uh, we're at time. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Makari Judson, for your information and your work in the presentation this evening. My pleasure. Good night, everyone.